Willkommen. Hallo. Welcome. Freue mich. Danke für die Einladung. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Claudia, äh, wir haben viel zu besprechen. Claudia, <lacht> Lass uns gleich loslegen. Ich werde auch zwischendurch mal gucken, wenn ihr Fragen für Claudia uh, habt. Ähm, dann schickt mir die gerne at uh, Geraldine, also die Geraldine nur mit B. Und ich schaue mal zwischendurch rein, was ihr so schickt. Claudia, du gehst schon lange, schon seit den 90ern zu den volkswirtschaftlichen Kosten vom Klimawandel und vor allem eben auch zum Kontext Abhängigkeit von fossilen Energien im Kontext von Frieden und Resilienz für Konflikte. Wie geht es dir gerade im Moment mit der aktuellen Lage? Hast du ein gesamtes I told you so Gefühl, mit dem du zurzeit unterwegs bist? Ja, also brutal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, told you so since 25 years, um, but you know, you have to keep repeating things, you have to keep making things very, very obvious and explicit, and currently we are in a very serious situation. We are in a never-seen-before energy crisis, but nobody's talking about it. And we just pretend that everything can continue as it has before. We drive around, we, we happily buy fossil gas, fracking gas, it's extremely damaging to the environment, instead of doing what we can do best, that's renewable energies, especially locally decentralized. And renewables are the best peace energies that we have, the best peace technology that we have, so why don't we use it more? That's what really uh, keeps me up, and that's why we have to take that corner, do more to use and expand the use of peace technology that we have and uh, involve everybody together. That would be my wish. And how do you feel looking at the current political situation in Germany, in Europe, and what do we experience this probing of, you know, oh, you know, we could do a little bit of um, nuclear energy, a little fossil energies, and people start talking about that again. And so how do we gain more independence from uh, Russian gas and oil? And I think that worries you, right? Uh, the, 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 the attempts to push these limits. Yeah, of course, but it's the, the old game that we're familiar with, and that's how we got to the point that we are at now, that we don't take all our energy from renewables, but instead we still have way too many coal-fired plants. Uh, we use too much uh, gas and natural gas that we warned about a long, long time, and we have to, to flip that switch. And still trying to stick to fossil fuels and adding new dependencies with the the next despots of the world. You know, Qatar isn't a friendly state either. That just makes the entire problem complicated. And nuclear energy is not a peace technology anyway. It's expensive and also creates uh, long-term dependencies. It creates nuclear waste. And we have to pay for that as well. We're pretty happy that we're out of that and to also want to try and get back to nuclear are the same that always prevented change as well. And that's why we're not where we could be and that drives me nuts. It's always the same debates and we don't really make progress, we don't really get to where we could be and would be very urgently needed. Yeah, and uh, the grip on power by energy lobbies, by fossil fuel companies, it's, it's just too strong, right? And po so uh, politics just isn't doing enough? Yeah, so uh, lobbying obviously is, is still very strong. I published a book in 2013, uh, The Battle for Power, and then The Fossil Empire Strikes Back. That's recently been re-released, and it's the same situation we're in today. We see we are in the midst of a fossil energy war and have to change direction. And because we, we keep trying to cling to the past so much and keep rehashing the same arguments over and over, that's what precludes this change that we need. And it will be so much smarter to expand wind power, expand solar power, and uh, become truly independent from fossil fuels and uh, the wars around them. And somehow we're having a really hard time with that. And we are definitely challenged to keep informing people, make it very, very explicit and obvious that we cannot continue the way we do, that we cannot create any more dependencies on fossil fuels, and we have to make that change. And somehow we're struggling with that. 
Und Solar erwähnt, so you've mentioned wind and solar power. What are the key technologies, uh, in your opinion, for um, a major change in our power policies? Yeah, it's, it's wind and solar power worldwide. Uh, solar on every roof that works in uh, any country. It also works in developing countries and it makes energy supply more resilient. Everybody can have solar power on their roofs, doesn't matter where. You don't even need to be attached to the power grid and that's the, the great advantage that one has when you use decentralized wind and solar power. But also other forms such as hydropower, depending on which country you're in, or biomass, if it's sustainable. You know, any kind of renewable energy sources are freedom technologies. So we, we should use them, we have to use them also to create global peace. And unfortunately we're failing because we are trapped in the rhetoric of the uh, always backwards looking f proponents of, of fossil fuels and their dependencies who are yeah, fighting change. Before we uh, talk more about the different sources of energy and other future technologies, can you talk about this correlation? It seems so obvious, but maybe expand a little bit on it. Why are these technologies peace technologies? Independence is one aspect, but what else? Yeah, fossil fuels create wars. That's not news. We've known that since the 70s, 80s. If we think about the oil wars or the oil crises we had back then, it's uh, also very interesting. Back in the day, we had a car-free Sunday. Nobody remembers that today. But uh, there was an initiative. I'm, I'm an energy saver. And there was a very serious energy crisis, and it's just as serious today. But still, we do not really perceive it the same way. And we're in the midst of this fossil energy war that is uh, weighing on us, it's weighing on the entire world. It's about fossil fuels, it's about the, the upkeep of this fossil dependency. And that is why we have to interpret it this way. This war that we currently see in Europe um, as horrible as it is, also has something to do with fossil fuels and fossil energy sources. And everything that re removes or reduces these dependencies strengthens our resiliency and creates peace and makes us independent from these very extreme positions and also the wars that, that happen there. So that's what it's about, that we, um, aside from, from fossil fuels like, like oil, that's probably the, the biggest cause, but also natural gas, one of the reasons we have a conflict with Russia now, and uh, nuclear power as well. Nuclear power comes from military development, from military science, and is a uh, technology of war. Even the peaceful use of nuclear power that is happening can still lead to development of nuclear weapons and it's uh, also always about nuclear powers in the world. So nuclear power is not a peace technology and everything that reduces these dependencies, so gross renewables that have no relation to, to fossil fuels or nuclear power, they strengthen peace worldwide. That's why it would be so important that we create cooperations to globally help these countries that, that need support in using more renewables, because this is how we create and sustain peace in the world for, for the future. Yeah, and so solar and hydropower, the global usage, uh, which could, you know, lead to a change on a global scale. And another thing is uh, hydrogen, right? And uh, people talk about green hydrogen. Um, can you talk about the role of that technology and maybe explain this differentiation between uh, hydrogen and green hydrogen? Yes, green hydrogen is hydrogen that is uh, generated using renewable energy. So all other colors aren't. If I use, for example, natural gas to produce hydrogen, I waste three to five times as much energy as I would just use uh, the renewable power directly. So it's always better to use uh, renewable energy directly instead of transforming it. The synthesis of uh, hydrogen is very, very energy intensive and it's not sustainable. Um, 
if, for example, I produce it with uh, fossil fuels such as coal or gas or even nuclear power. So that's not sustainable at all. And then if I try to cooperate with countries where, water, uh, where hydrogen is produced in a non-sustainable fashion, it causes high cost but also environmental damage in these countries due to, for example, the uh, natural gas um, uh, sourcing and the, the follow-on damage that's happening to the environment. So our demand is if we are to use hydrogen, it should be green, and we are asking for a certificate that also proves that if hydrogen is created, then it is happening based on sustainable renewable energy sources. And of course, it's also important that we stick to social standards, that we do not exploit workers. And the same thing that we have now for um, like organic produce, for example, we need something similar for energy sources. So that green hydrogen is the only hydrogen source that is sustainable, that is uh, climate protecting. And we have this big, this big discussion now that's, okay, green hydrogen is great, but we don't have it yet. Um, it will take forever until we have it. So now we need to use coal and natural gas or nuclear power to produce hydrogen. But then we just cause more problems down the line rather than using uh, the renewable power immediately and directly. So green hydrogen sounds good. And uh, there, there's a good like goal behind it in the future where we have a surplus of renewable energy. But beware of a labeling where now we see fossil interests coming through the back door and saying, okay, well, you know, currently we have natural gas, currently we have coal, we're just going to use to produce hydrogen and that makes it green uh, sometime in the future, somewhere down the line. And a lot of happening, uh, a lot is happening there, right? There's uh, new uh, energy partnerships uh, between Germany and uh, other countries um, to create green hydrogen in the future. And there's different countries now, like uh, Chile, um, who put themselves on the map as um, uh, a place for renewable energies. And and this is a potential leap, a huge change geopolitically from our fossil world today to a renewable energy world in the, of the future, right? It's changing rapidly. Every country has the opportunity to build out renewables and then also use that to build, produce, for example, hydrogen. Some countries have better geologic um, a better geologic basis than, than others. So it may make sense to also cooperate about hydrogen production. That's that's all right and well. And I think it's also sensible that Germany takes part in these cooperations. But I also wonder, uh, why not just use the, the green energy in these countries directly? Why does it have to go into something that we know from the desert tech world, where we give you solar power, but only if the, the, the energy that's produced comes back to us, or if we can import green hydrogen. So it's it's not wrong in principle, but there is a danger here that you don't um, expand renewables per se, but but rather even restrict it, and that would be that would be worse. So I'm a big believer in partnerships, but it should always be focused on renewable energy, on green energy, solar energy, wind energy, and in the end, when we really have large amounts of, of renewable energy and a surplus, then maybe we can do hydrogen. So how does it change the global order? Every country can, can enact this change on their own. And only then we can reach the climate goals that we heard about several times already today. Emissions have to sink, they have to sink rapidly, and this is not going to be possible with oil or coal or natural gas. And that's why we have to get out of that so quickly. And everybody who's now starting wars because they want to remain in this dependency as long as possible, it's it's very, very visible in the moment that we have reached a tipping point here, a tipping point that could tip into the direction of we, we take that corner uh, towards renewables or the fossil empire will prevail and we are trapped in a world for the next decades where energy is produced from fossil sources. So this the struggle is real and you have to understand this is always there in the background. It's not a coincidence that uh, Russia chose this time to, to invade Ukraine, for example. 
the, the Green New Deal is, is part of the reason in, in Europe. Europe wants to go all out on, on renewables, and that means we will not buy oil or gas or ga um, um, coal from Russia in the future. And this is already happening, but still there is the idea that, you know, once we pacified Ukraine, then we can go back and, and make new deals with Russia again. And that's the problem. That means we will never reach the path we actually need, uh, covering all our energy needs with renewables. And that's why it is incredibly important to take the right steps into this direction and break up these, these power dynamics, create new corporations and do everything we can to expand the use of renewables globally. That's the only way to answer this challenge. Yeah, feel free to applaud. Another thing I've asked myself is, you know, these countries have instability in their own energy supply, and so how do these uh, relationships of trade need to look so that it's not just um, Western countries exploiting so-called developing countries? Uh, how can, you know, these relationships really be partnerships that are about collaboration? Yeah, that's, that's the goal. That's what it is about. There has to be a serious partnership here, and that means not just that we go and exploit resources and then, then take the results and, you know, go away again. That shouldn't happen. But instead, renewables have the big advantage that it happens locally, within the countries, solar energy on the roofs, wind energies in, in, uh, on the countryside, biomass sustainably sourced, and also maybe hydro, uh, hydropower. Um, the geopolitical power dynamics are broken up this way, and you can get away from this resource dependency that we currently have. In theory, it could create new dependencies. If we think, for example, uh, certain uh, base materials, you need to create solar panels or that you need for, for wind power generators, but that's more manageable if we keep researching, if uh, if we keep doing what Germany is good at, uh, producing innovation so that we can get away from this, these material dependencies, not just oil and coal and gas, but also rare earth minerals that we need, for example. And it's about forcing these technologies and this progress to reduce these dependencies. And now that you've mentioned it, if we could open up these innovations so that they're usable on a global scale and scalable even, and not just in use by a single um, company and their, um, uh, and their way of making money. Yeah, exactly. It's important that it's scalable and that it can also be used in, in any country. Because renewables are so successful, costs keep coming down. It doesn't make any sense to still build a nuclear power plant these days. It is incredibly expensive. It takes a very long time. It creates nuclear waste, including a lot of follow-on dangers, and it increases conflict in the world. So I'm really wondering why, I mean, there's always the, the background that um, the, the expansion of renewables is being slowed down in order to keep these dependencies alive as long as possible. But the more we realize that and understand that the only way forward is to expand renewables globally, the better. And we must not only supply these countries uh, with the technology, but also ensure that it's actually happening, uh, decentralized energy sources, and then finally uh, grow, grow peace in the world. So those that are trying to prevent that are the same people that are trying to start conflicts and wars, and we have to get out of that. And it seems so obvious, right? Yeah, it's, it's really obvious. And the, the answer is really not complicated, but there is a very strong um, correlation here with geodynamic power relations. And it's much easier to just go to Qatar and, and take a deal on... Uh, liquid natural gas, for example, which is horribly damaging to the environment. We create new dependencies for 20, 25 years on end. We create new liquid natural gas terminals in Germany that we do not need uh, up to 12. It's, it's complete insanity. We don't need them, and that's why it would be so important to realize we don't need all of this stuff if we manage to consequently expand wind energy, solar energy, or get solar energy on the roofs. Um, there is a uh, proposed law right now in Parliament targeting exactly this, to use 2% of the uh, state's area in Germany to, to use uh, generate wind power. And it's not a lot. 2% is not a lot of area. 
And we use so much more uh, surface area for, you know, supermarkets, roads, parking. And then there's no room left for, for renewables, for wind energy. Uh, that cannot be. The priorities have to shift. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to have a wind generator in their, in their garden. But some German states um, just must be forced to take part, to participate, to make available the necessary resources in areas. And if we bring this technology to bear, then we can actually make it. And we can uh, master the climate crisis and also correspondingly the economic crisis and create peace in the world. Yeah, uh, call to action. Maya uh, said this this morning, um, putting our voices together, uh, doing uh, advocacy and yeah, today this law was brought into German Parliament and, you know, we really need to be louder than the uh, voices that are trying to uh, block renewable energies. Yeah, there's, there's some really great communities. I keep traveling to Germany and there's places that get 100% of their energy from renewables. Even in Bavaria, there's a lot of, um, a lot of communities that want to expand renewables, but that they are prevented by the state government. And it's important that we say, yes, okay, we have to tackle these conflicts and create ways that maybe maybe evade the conflicts when you want to expand wind power. But a large part of people want to expand renewables. They want to shape it and design it. But why don't we let them? I don't get it. That is hard to grasp. A different aspect we wanted to talk about is it's important that um, renewable energies, also technologies of peace, uh, when looking at it from a gender uh, point of view. And so could you expand on that? Um, one thing I think is that more women are uh, working in renewable energies. Uh, than in fossil energies, um, but also when you look at it on a global scale, it's important, right? No, it's it's really the case. There's more women in the area of renewable energies, and the reason is probably that many come in with a certain system of values and are looking for more sustainable and future-proof jobs, and then find ways to address this uh, at their workplace. And Yes, of course, uh, fossil energy industries pay very well. There's a lot of highly paid men working in there, but this is breaking up and women often have this approach that they want to change something, they want to move to something, uh, they want to achieve change. Um, men want this too as well, but, but it is pretty obvious that there is a big gap here. And also, if you look globally, women are disproportionately affected by climate change, much more often than men, uh, due to various reasons, but you, one has to see that that is the way it is, and it's uh, important to enable these women to create uh, education, to create ways to tackle climate change, understand climate change, and find ways uh, out of it and around of it. And uh, again, renewables are a big part of that. And the same applies for many possibilities, for example, in, in Africa to install solar power on a roof where there is energy instead of maybe building a uh, environmentally damaging wood-fired oven that burns wood in the apartment and then needs to follow on health impact. So there's a lot of possibilities here, but it's important that you create a, a, an environment for both men and women where they can improve and where they can shape this change. Absolutely. So, we've just got this uh, legal package, um, controversial measures in Parliament, but when we talked about now, what are you looking at? This morning I talked to Maya about this, you know, responsibility on an individual level. Um, we've waited for too long, the industry didn't want to move. And now we need to have this change in our mobility, in our energy, and we all have to participate in that. And so what do you want uh, when looking at this transition? So I would really hope that we make progress with the expansion of renewables. So for wind energy, it's just making the areas available, uh, making the space available. For each state, um, I would wish for better um, better legislation and, and less bureaucracy around the expansion of solar energy. There's just too many constraints, uh, too many slowdowns, and this has led to this 
uh, inequity that some German states do a lot for the expansion of renewables, others do way less. And there's always this uh, sociological component which is always an argument if you want to prevent climate uh, protection. It's it's interesting to see that you know some people suddenly have an interest in um, in in poor people when it's you know about preventing climate protection um, and possibilities to reduce the load there. Um, but they're also against other opportunities to to reduce the impact of the climate crisis on these, like a uh, climate for example. So we need more ways to to include people to to have them participate in this change that we need. Then, if we want to reach an equitable climate protection program and uh, something like a uh, per capita redistribution of CO2 expenses is part of that, but um, also you know other opportunities. So. What we see right now, for example, we have the war, and that means the prices for fossil energy sources are exploding. So those that use oil and gas for heating will have probably a three to four x increase in their energy costs. Uh, energy, uh, the power bills would increase, and why? Because we didn't tackle this soon enough. And now we have this, the people coming out saying, "Oh, you know, no, it's renewables." Um, that are the cause of these these high energy costs, and that is not the case. Renewable energy sources reduce the power bill for people. They they reduce the cost of power, and this is something we have to keep reiterating, because there's a lot of people that would try to to uh, try and prevent this transition. Fact is, coal is expensive, oil is expensive, gas is expensive, renewables are cheap, and that's why we should use this. If only people listen to you more. Uh, kind of technical question from the audience, from Yannick. What are the best ways to use uh, a surplus of energy from renewable energies uh, or to uh, save it uh, for the time being? There are many possibilities. The most uh, well-known one is pumping, uh, pumping water storage. We have a few of these in Germany. Then there's battery storage. Battery energy storage can also be used in the home. There is some communes that use batteries for, for larger installations. You can even couple different electric car batteries and store battery in those. And there's a several prosumer approaches where you produce and consume power at the same time, for example, using solar energy uh, combined with uh, battery storage. In the in the long term or even in the midterm, uh, hydrogen will probably play a role, green hydrogen, and also certain e-fuels. So if you use hydrogen and add CO2, then you have synthetic fuels that are uh, energy storage devices in the end. That's not an, an immediate help right now. Um, if you want to do that today, probably you should ask your commune or just go into battery storage. Thank you very much. I think this half hour passed too quickly, but if uh, people are more interested in what you do, uh, you'll uh, sign your autograph um, behind the stage, um, your current book. Um, it's also available there, and you've taught us so much today. And so, one last sentence from you today to the audience. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm happy to see this topic addressed so broadly here. We need this awareness, we need information, we need education and also motivation, which doesn't mean that we put the entire onus on individuals, but all of you who are listening, go home tonight and tell your family, tell your friends, your children, your partners about what you've seen and heard here today. And that already makes a difference, because if we have a group and more and more people that understand what it's about and what we need to do, and then find communal approaches, then we can make this change happen. I'm very convinced of that. So I'm very happy that there's a lot of cool people here and we, we can tackle this as a community. Thank you. We're very glad to have you here today. And so please give a word.